Awesome for Rentals. Hey YouTube, Awesome Writer here. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the public perception of Power Rangers. As we recently had some news about the Power Rangers Netflix reboot being canceled, and it brought to light some information about Hasbro and the way they've thought about the brand, and it kind of just brings up stuff we've talked about before and how people see the Power Rangers brand, from people that have worked on it to the casual fans. Because Power Rangers doesn't have the greatest public perception. It has this really weird public perception where it sits on this fence almost like in a permanent purgatory where it's a recognizable brand. I think most people, especially in like geek culture, know what Power Rangers is, especially Mighty Morphin because it was a, a moment in pop culture. But at the same time, it's still very niche. And also, usually the general attitude of it, especially for those that grew up with it or watched it, is like, oh man, I used to watch that as a kid, it was so awesome. But it's also the lamest garbage I've ever seen. And that's kind of where it sits, which makes it sit in this really weird and awkward position for trying to make the brand happen. You know, we've already talked extensively about, like, the MMPR problem, about them only focusing on MMPR because it's the only recognizable one, and I still think that's true. I think people seem to forget, too, when it comes to that, that it's not just about it only being the first, but, like, MMPR's boom was like a moment in pop culture. Like, it wasn't as big as, like, Pokemon's boom or something, but it was a moment in pop culture that was memorable, and... People seem to forget that in terms of the context of why MMPR is like ingrained in the popular culture, which is why it's like the one that people think of. And then again, it goes into that same mindset of like, man, MMPR was awesome, Tommy and Jason were awesome, but also that show was lame as hell! You know, people get caught up, I think, when we talk about this topic of, I think the fans have a hard time seeing past the fandom bubble. They're like, well, me and my friends talking online like SPD, so why don't they just do an SPD show? I'm like, dude, but the general public doesn't know about SPD. Same thing with Sentai, but like, me and my friends want them to dub Sentai, or, or you know, like, no, just... You, the general public knows MMPR, and that's it. And people will also say, you know, well, I grew up with this season, and whatever. It's like, that's true, but there's a difference between big shows like MMPR at the time or Pokemon that, like, almost everybody at the time grew up with. And then there's other shows that, sure, like, there's probably hundreds of thousands of people maybe that grew up with it, but it remained small. Like, this is a random example, but I watched Metabots. I'm sure a lot of you remember that, but that's a show that I could bring up to people, and they probably aren't going to know. So I'm not going to be like, well... I watched Metabots when I grew up, so obviously that's going to be the next big thing. Anyway, went on a bit of a tangent there. So, the public perception of PR, the thing that's confusing about it is I totally understand why people see PR the way that they do. However, I don't understand why they can't see the potential in it. Because if you strip away using the Sentai footage and all the cheesy weird stuff that Sentai does, and the Pleasantville dialogue, and all of the little weird niche things that make Power Rangers and Sentai like that, the core concept is superheroes that transform into cool costumes and pilot robots. And that has so many elements of so many other franchises that are popular and that have taken off. And the fact that people can't see the potential in it, like, hey, we could rework this into something really cool. They just can't see past that cheesy facade. You know, like, on the other hand, you, you have the hardcore fans that are very close-minded about, oh, I can't take away the Tuku aspects, you have to keep it the same always. And it's like... I think we need to find a balance in that. But it's a, such an uphill battle. Like, that's the thing is, you know... As upsetting as this news about Hasbro is in terms of the Netflix reboot being canceled and Netflix not wanting to do it and Hasbro seeing it as a difficult brand to deal with and not wanting it, it's also understandable because Power Rangers is such a tough sell and it's weird because it shouldn't be. I said the concept is actually really cool if you take away some of the stuff that's a little bit more off-putting about it. Something I really thought about when it comes to this topic, kind of the center point of this, is comparing it to Ninja Turtles. And I thought about this a lot last year, almost a year ago, because I thought about making a video in a similar vein when Mutant Mayhem came out. Because I was thinking about, obviously there's a lot of differences in the brands for sure, but also, I always felt like they were kind of two sides of the same coin in a way. And they have a lot of similarities in terms of their place in pop culture and people's childhoods. And yet the public perception is very different. Meaning, like, when something Power Rangers is announced or it's heard about, again, you get that whole, like, man, that's lame. Like, you're basically laughing at it and not with it for Power Rangers. Like, if you come out with a new show or whatever and you hear about the Once and Always reboot, people are going to be laughing at it, as we saw from a lot of the fan or casual fan reactions to Once and Always. But when you see the, the new TMNT movies coming out, people are like, yeah, I'll check that out. It'll be awesome. Like, I, I'm sure there's people, but I've never seen anybody... I mean, yeah, of course, when the old movies, the, not the old movies, but the Michael Bay ones came out, you had, like, the group think, like, oh, Michael Bay made it, it's gonna suck. Like, he just produced it. But anyway, those movies actually weren't so bad. The second one was honestly a lot of fun. Anyway, the point is, is that's, like, a totally different issue, is the Michael Bay thing. I don't even know how that came up. But the point is, like, when Mutant Mayhem came out, if something like that comes out, Mutant Mayhem, 
or you hear about a new Turtles project, most of the fans are like, yeah, Turtles, awesome, let's check it out. Like, I very rarely see people be like, Turtles were lame. They're like, no, the Turtles were awesome. And it's like, why does PR not get that same benefit of the doubt? I think that that's really fascinating. I think that there's obviously, like, a, a myriad of reasons you could list, but I still find it to be crazy that Power Rangers can't seem to get any respect. I mean, both of them kind of are one of the quintessential shows for their era for kids. You know, Turtles being the 80s, Power Rangers being the 90s, of a sort of similar vein. Like, kind of crazy to compare the two because they're both very similar and very different at the same time. But they're basically, you know, teenage heroes fighting weird monsters in a very cheesy, silly show that you go back to and it's very dated. And the thing is, is that when you do go revisit the 80s Turtles and MMPR, you see how dated it is, and it isn't as easy to rewatch. Although I more so concretely watched through some of the 80s series like a year or two ago, and I was surprised by how serialized some of it was. Like, it's more enjoyable than MMPR season one, I'll tell you that for nothing. Anyway, the point is, is that both of those shows have that factor of like, oh man, I thought this was so awesome and I was a little bit, it's a little bit cheesy. Again, and, and yet, Power Rangers is the one that gets disrespect. It's possible... It's, I mean, more than possible. It's possible it's because Turtles does come from a darker comic, so you have, you know, those edgelords that are like, I only like serious stuff now, and I can back this up by the fact that it came from a dark comic. But it's kind of like a parody. It's like a dark parody of Daredevil, though. But you know what I mean. I think it's probably because of that. Because, you know, MMPR, I mean, it's sourced from Sentai, which inherently has a lot of silly stuff that's off-putting to some audiences. But just in terms of that show, the source of the show, there was no like prerequisite Power Rangers thing that was like a gritty comic or anything. So Turtles did have the comic. And then, of course, in the subsequent years, after Turtles 1980s, they had lots of projects that were more appealing and more mature. You know, you had the original 90s movie, which still holds up very well. Uh, Secret of the Ooze, a little sillier, but still a lot of fun. You had the 2003 series, the 2012 series. Um, I've only read a couple of them, but I've heard they're very good, the IDW comics. But the point is, is like MMPR, and Power Rangers evolved, but I don't think it had as robust of a uh, career and maturity growth that Turtles did. But still, even still, it's very frustrating and confusing the fact that people can't see past it. Like, yes, we acknowledge it. Power Rangers, it was lame. It was weird. It was cheesy. But can you not see that we could make a cool show out of five heroes transforming and fighting with giant robots? Like, how could you not see the potential in that? And that's the thing is I think that there needs to be a balance between a lot of people, the fans, get very close-minded and protective over the idea of taking it away from its roots, which I understand to a degree, but I think there's value in shaping it into a different lens if we can find somebody to do that. Something we did find out about the reboot too, which I forgot to discuss in yesterday's video, is that Toku J was going to be working on it for the suit designs, and if you've seen his stuff, the suits look very much in line with kind of a perfect hybrid of something a little bit more modern, but also very much sticking to that core aesthetic. So just think of that sort of aesthetic as maybe what the good midway point would be, is keeping some of the core what PR is, but modernizing it, making it a little bit less of the cheesiness we know. But the thing is, I've talked about this before too, is I think that there's value in having things being seen through a different lens to appeal to a different audience. And then they might be able to actually appreciate the original version as well. And this is an example I've brought up before, but my fandom was Star Trek. Growing up, and for a long time, I wasn't a fan of Star Trek. I didn't like the look of it. I thought it was kind of like Pierre. I thought it was cheesy and silly and dated, and I could never really get into it. Then they came out with the modern movies, which was just kind of more of a lens for me, more of a sci-fi action movie. I do think there's elements of a little bit of the classic Star Trek, Star Trek? Star Trek stories in there, but that was like a lens in which it was taking Star Trek and it was now seeing it through a lens that I was more susceptible to. And as a result, I went back and I was able to check out the older series. Now I love all the Star Trek. I didn't all of a sudden turn on and be like, they were right, those movies suck, I'm a purist now. No, I still love the new movies. But now Next Generation is my favorite series without question, and I got to appreciate that classic core Star Trek aesthetic and the style of it. And I do prefer that, even though I do love me a good action Trek movie or a serialized story like Discovery. My, I do prefer the Next Generation Voyager type format. But the point is, is that 
because it was shown to me in a different way that showed me like, hey, this could be kind of cool, give it a chance, it opened me up to it. That's not going to work for everybody, but I think if they can modernize PR and make it a little bit something more appealing here, then it might open up people to be more open to the version we know, and then they might be able to make that later. You know, that's kind of happened to a degree with Star Trek in the sense that, you know, they brought up Strange New Worlds, which is a little bit more akin to the classic series, a little bit more episodic with some, with some corniness. I love that series. Love me some Captain Pike. But you know what I mean. I think that the fans need to loosen the reins on that and accept that we might have to get a version that steps away from some of the stuff. I saw some people saying that taking the, the, the Sentai footage out is like ripping the soul out of PR. I'm like, the soul? It's a... Japanese toy commercial. The point is, is that ideally we need to find that, that lens that we can be seen through, that modernizes it, that can get people to see the potential. And it's so unbelievably frustrating that, because, I think, it, obviously MMPR has still been in the forefront, which probably doesn't help in terms of, that's what people go back to is that season one thing. And I know that there's reasons why, and yet I still can't see why people cannot see the potential in it because just strip away the cheesiness, the posing, the dialogue, and the concept is there. I think the only time I've seen kind of like a microcosm of this is the comics, meaning that I've seen, I think the comics creative team was the first creative team or teams that worked on it that have seen and taken full advantage of the potential of the world. And I think that's where my divide comes with a lot of the community, as a lot of the community, when they got into PR, and then as a result, Sentai and Rider, they started to lean more towards the toku side, And but I'm more lean towards the comic side, where I want it to be more like a superhero comic thing. Like, people will often say to me, do you want it to just become like a superhero comic brand? And I'm like, yes. I've seen that a micro scale of what I'd like to see for the franchise with the comics, meaning you have a creative team that actually saw the potential of it, that made good stories out of it. You know, people like Kyle Higgins, I read, I think, an interview with him in one of the, the trade paperbacks of Radiant Black I, I picked up, and he was talking about how he grew up with Power Rangers and wanted to make cool versions of that when he wrote PR comics and then Radiant Black, and so stuff like that. It was a creative team that actually saw the potential and took advantage of it. But also, it was an outlet for casual fans to see that actually good and cool stories can come from this world and these suits. You know, the hardcore fandom isn't the only one buying the comics. There's a large amount of casual fans, because if it was only the hardcore fandom, it still wouldn't be around. It's a very small fandom. But people were talking about that a lot. You know, I brought this up before, but I remember how exciting Shattered Grid was. There was a genuine hype, not just in the core fandom, but even at large. I remember people in my comic shop, there was like two times I was people talking about it freely when I went, went in there on the day it came out. And like every time I'd pick up the latest issue, the people that were in there or the cashier or the, whoever was there would start talking about it because they were reading it. So that was a nice microcosm of seeing a creative team and casual fans see the potential in it. And I'd like to see that overall. I mean, I remember even, I think, it's like some of the comic channels like covered it, like Comic Historian, like, holy crap, man, dude. Speaking of, man, holy crap, R.I.P. Comic Historian. That one hit me hard. Like, I watch his videos fairly regularly. He was, he was one of the good ones, man. That, that was, that sucked. But I saw that he was covering that, um, and also, um, Comic Explained, too, or they do, like, explaining the stories and reading the stories, so it had broader appeal, and I would like to see eventually the franchise get to that where you can get a creative team that sees the potential, takes advantage of it, and then the casual fans and new fans can actually latch onto it. But as of right now, it's just very unfortunate that setting aside any company that's worked on it or missteps, I think its biggest obstacle has always been itself and its public perception because it can't find a new audience, it can't bring back the larger casual audience, and even the people that work on the brand don't have respect for it often or look as, look at it as lesser and don't see the potential. It's like all they can see is the cheesiness and they can't see the coolness. But what do you think? What do you guys think are some of the core reasons why Power Rangers can't break its public perception compared to other brands like TMNT. Let me know in the comments as always. Until next time, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and climb the steps and ring that bell to get notifications for my videos. Dawson Ryder, signing out.